Well, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. We are here to celebrate Women's History Month, and this is the first of our series of In Conversations With, which is coming to us courtesy of Sousa's Women in Tech. So every week for the month of March, we'll be hosting an In Conversation With dialogue, and we're gonna have a guest speaker, and we've got a very special guest speaker today, but I will leave Katarina to do the introductions shortly. And in, in these hour sessions, we're going to take you through a journey of resilience, resolve, creativity and achievement. And we're going to basically just unpack how our special guests have managed to navigate and break down biases. You know, we've all experienced that in some shape or form. So with each session, we're going to have a Q&A session after the formal interview section and please do join in for that Q&A. Send your questions through the Q question and answer feed that you'll see on the control panel. I'll be looking out for those questions so I look forward to speaking up on your behalf and today I'm going to hand over to Katarina to actually introduce our very special guest and I'm not going to say anything more other than that they are here to discuss the power of bias and negative perceptions in fiction. So over to you, Katerina. Thanks, Jenny. I am so, so delighted to have Naomi Novik here. Honestly, when her assistant said that she would be willing to do this program, I almost fell out of my chair because this is one of those moments in life when you really reach for the stars and the stars come down and meet you halfway. <laughs> Naomi Novik is a New York Times bestselling author. She is a world builder and her books um, on, uh, on the Last Graduate and The Deadly Education, two of the books in the Scholomen series are being turned into a third book that's being released this fall that I absolutely can't wait to read. But one of the very first introductions that I had to Naomi Novik was my friend said to me, hey, you like to read, read this book. It's called Spinning Silver. There is this Jewish girl in there who makes money and you make money. So <laughs> it was one of those really big butterfly effects in my life where I read a book and I found Naomi's website and submitted a request. And now here I am with her in person, virtually live asking questions. But I'm not the only one to whom that has happened. Naomi, something similar happened to you when you were in college. Can you tell us how you went from watching Star Trek with your classmates to becoming a world building award winning author? Well, thank you. I mean, you know, it's so lovely that you connected to me through my books. Um, you know, that's that's always the most fun. Um, and and I'm just so delighted to be here and talking about this because my path um, is something that I think is, you know, it's a path that that came that has gone in and out through tech um, as well in various ways. And so, in fact, the the um, that was sort of the first step. What happened to me in college was I went to college, determined never again to take a science class. Um, I specifically went to Brown because there was a completely open curriculum. You could follow whatever you wanted. You didn't have to, you, you had to complete the requirements for a major, but you didn't have to sort of take a standard core curriculum. And I really wanted to follow my passion. I wanted to write. Um, I wanted to, in fact, be a journalist. Um, I think, actually, to be honest, I think what I wanted at that point was to be Lois Lane. Um, sadly, not a job you can actually apply for. Um, but so then what happened was my sophomore year, I actually ended up living in a dormitory where all the other women around me um, happened to be women in science. And one of the things that we that they did once a week there, uh, we were, it was like single rooms, except one, two of us had a huge double room. And once a week on Wednesdays, we would pile in and watch Star Trek The Next Generation together. Um, and I think literally the first episode that I saw was The Inner Light, which is a good, a good way to start. Um, and very quickly, I sort of, I, I wanted more. And one of the other women told me, well, you can get an account on the Vax VMS servers and get on the Star Trek L mailing list. Um, and people talk about Star Trek and, uh, and I got on. Um, and this was, 
you know, I, I was fortunate enough in that both my parents were in computers in computer science. And so I, I could do it. Um, it was not, it was not that complicated, but I, you know, sort of get getting to that intersection of sort of uh, creativity and and technology and science all sort of came together for me. Um, and in fact, I then uh, ended up sort of pivoting basically because of my experience um, through, you know, just sort of through that I ended up spending most of my senior year building a uh, multi-user text adventure games um, and actually came out of Brown with my English degree and promptly um, got a job at, in an internet startup and then went to Columbia for grad school in computer science. So that that is sort of the complicated path um, that that, you know, sort of speaking about bias, right? A lot of times, you know, especially here in the US, um, and I think it's it's not so much in Eastern Europe in particular, um, but at least in the US, uh, there was there's a lot of sort of unspoken, unseen kind of societal pressure that kind of quietly tells you that science and math and computer science in particular are sort of not for girls. Yeah. And nobody ever deliberately told me that, right? In fact, I got the opposite. My parents were constantly like, you know, we had a computer at home. Um, and yet, you know, it's hard not to absorb things through osmosis. You know, it's the water that you swim in. And then, but that experience in college uh, really kind of reconnected me back to it through story, right? And I think that that is sort of a really key key tool, in fact, for that was at least it was a key piece for me, was that, you know, the idea of computers as a sort of abstract thing, of math as an abstract thing, science as an abstract thing, um, had had been kind of was kind of pulled away from me but narrative and the desire to use it for something right to use it for storytelling to use it to build games um and which all of that ultimately because the the key thing about all these experiences right both writing fanfic reading fanfic reading conversations on a mailing list um building multi-user games all of it was about finding and building community right and doing things within a community being rewarded by support from that community and those were the things that helped me sort of get myself back in in a way that's incredible i understand what you mean i for my entire academic career did the best that i could to stay away from math and if anyone knows anything about business it is math <laughs> my whole <laughs> life is math. <laughs> um, but the fact that we do have community really helps us embrace that part of ourselves. I used to introduce myself as a humanitarian, you know, I'm all about the qualitative things. And I came to SUSA and it's an open source company where we embrace all of the differences that we bring. And even if you're not a math person, you can still find your place. But it helps us really start going into those initial first perceptions of ourselves and being able to with more confidence portray ourselves in a way that we want to be portrayed and that's what i love about your books is that you just are so good at giving that first impression in a book which for our readers out there you understand that a book's first impression is the first line of a book so Naomi, i want to read two first lines from two of your books the first one is uprooted which is an amazing story that also weaves in um slavic mythology for any of you the first line our dragon doesn't eat the girls he takes no matter the stories they tell outside our valley and from a deadly education the first of the Scala Man series, I decided that Orion needed to die after the second time he saved my life. <laughs> so these first impressions 
um, even in books or in ourselves, we're always fighting against the unconscious, conscious biases that people have. And you, you don't know who's going to read your books. Like you have no idea who's going to pick it up and really dive into it. So as a writer, what are you keenly aware of when you're writing your books and in, in trying to structure or not structure the ways your audience will receive them? You know, so for me, um, my writing is my writing is always first and foremost for me right um i don't actually tend to outline or plan out my work in advance uh so the way in fact that i get myself into a project is i find a first line <laughs> i write the first line and if i want to know well what's going on in this first line um then i keep going um because at that moment there's nobody else to tell me but me <laughs> uh and so you know for instance with uprooted um it was very much about uh i actually had been working on the temeraire series which is nine volumes long and i was supposed to be writing the eighth volume and i was a little blocked and i sort of thought you know i i love the dragons in the temeraire series because they're sort of so so realistic so concrete um they're meant to be sort of uh, to feel like they are real creatures in our real world but I also love the fantastical myths and legends of dragons. And so with Uprooted, I really kind of, I was sitting there thinking, it would be fun to sort of play with dragon legends, dragon myths, and um, you know, the the sort of the myth of like the maiden being sacrificed to the dragon, right? That classic uh, sort of story was one that I wanted to kind of play with because, you know, so much, so much fiction right often uh you know when you have sort of the, there's this common trope in a lot of fantasy fiction where there is this sort of you know horrible human sacrifice right and that trope is something that appears literally like even in the bible right um with abraham and isaac and in fact you know i've i've read uh some work that sort of argues that one of the key the key pieces of the sacrifice of isaac in in the bible right it's it's precisely that God has to prove he's worthy of being worshipped by refusing to take that sacrifice, right? Um, and that is, you know, that that sort of covenant, right? Um, is is what makes is is sort of a key piece, right? In that in that religious story, and so um, and so because of that i kind of wanted to take this legend right the legend of this sacrifice and sort of move away from it pull away from it so in other words they're, they're saying no he doesn't eat us the dragon does not eat us if they tried to if the dragon was going to kill us or do horrible you know just sort of unbearably horrible things to us our parents would not would not do it right and what that tells you is that the community that you're in is a community right where it's not um you know there might be sacrifices asked of members of the community but it's not an inhuman sacrifice right it is not the sort of community that where where um the members of the community are treated as basically disposable even if they are even if they're girls right um which is you know there are many sort of fantasy universes where that is kind of the point there's a sort of idea that there's supposed to be this kind of shocking, um, you know, dystopian quality. Uh, and, and in fact, I wanted to actively move away from it. And that is part of what's going on in that line, right? That I'm engaging with the, the classic myth, the classic sort of fairy tale myth of the sacrifice. Um, then I'm engaging with the sort of the fantasy fiction trope of of these sort of dystopian sacrifices actually happening um because of course in fairy tales and myths the the maiden being tied to a rock you know andromeda or whatever uh that's not that doesn't have the same sort of um that does that kind of story doesn't take place in the same level of realism as typical fantasy fiction does right um you know it's a sort of more watercolor uh kind of kind of position as i like to think of it um and so the 
so I'm sort of engaging in both of those tropes and saying, and now in reaction to that, here's something it, that's that's what it's reacting to. And I'm expecting the reader to kind of have some sense of those things, some sense of those stories in them um, and and then reacting to them. Uh, and and obviously it still works, even if you don't necessarily know all these tropes, um, but they're also such common tropes that most people, most readers will have them, will have some, some understanding. Um, and that is more broadly how I approach all my work, which is yeah. the sense of being in conversation, right? Being in dialogue with not, with other works uh, of fiction, with um, fairy tales, with mythology, um, with things that I sort of expect to be in the reader's head. And one of the things that I sort of like to sort of say is when, when you kind of acknowledge your sources, when you work more intimately with other sources, as opposed to focusing really hard on like being as sort of extremely original as you can, the value that you get when you're engaging pretty closely with um, a, a sort of a classic trope, a classic story, is that you can engage with what the reader expects in multiple ways. So you can do something completely new, completely original that you've just made up that's not connected to any piece of story. And that can be surprising. You can give the reader the things that they expect from the story, right? From the from the trope, from the, the legend. So for instance, in Uprooted, there is a kind of sacrifice. There's a sort of choosing, right? And this happens. Um, and at the same time, you can also engage with that uh, trope and then go in a sort of consciously opposed direction, right? So you get these three different levels of engagement in fiction when, when you allow yourself to sort of closely be in more sort of direct and open dialogue with other works of fiction, whether that's mythology or, you know, for instance, Deadly Education is very clearly, I think, in conversation with Harry Potter and more broadly the magic boarding school trope. And that's not, I, that is kind of our modern mythology, right? You know, um, and, and so being able to rely on that and play with it lets you tell stories in multiple, in multiple ways. Absolutely. And as you said, not only are your readers coming to your books with their own stereotypes and biases that they've picked up or or swam in, as you said, their osmosis picked up, um, but your characters also have those biases. And in one way, it makes them way more relatable and makes me as a reader feel less like a bad person because I can see the challenges the characters are living through, uh, like Galadriel in um, the Scullaman series, who's like really the bad guy right she has this math i don't know if it's a spoiler but she has a really big superpower and everyone's scared of her and maybe maybe she's a little bit scared of herself and in spinning silver uh, miriam faces prejudice she's a debt collecting jewish woman and then she marries a creature who almost destroys the planet mm -hmm. uh, so through your writing have you been able to change the narrative on these negative perceptions and as you explore your stories are you consciously trying to do so you know, um, I mean, here's sort of the broad answer is that what I'm trying to do whenever I'm writing a character, right, is just try and inhabit them um, as a whole person. And whole people have um, have biases and assumptions. Um, they have been hurt and those hurts uh, drive them, you know, in different directions. And so in Miriam, you know, Miriam in particular, right, is uh, it, it is in many ways um, inspired by my grandmother. Um, you know, my grandmother uh, lived through lived through World War II as a refugee um, in Russia, and then um, was originally born in Lithuania in a part of Lithuania that was then in Poland. And she and her family were really kind of trying to get out, basically get out from behind the Iron Curtain. For, for many years. Um, and one of the things that she ended up doing in this was she was smuggling dollars. She was smuggling dollars in exchange for gold. And this was extremely illegal. Um, and you know, people were literally being put to death. She ended up in jail at one point. Um, and this is sort of like a little piece of family mythology, right? That, that sort of dollars for gold that stuck in a child's head. 
and uh, and then at some point, um, you know, because of Uprooted, because Uprooted is so sort of tied to fairy tales, uh, I was asked to participate in an anthology called um, The Starlit Wood, where we were all retelling a different fairy tale. And there was a long list. And because I'm a procrastinator, I did not pick anything off the list until the list got quite short. And then I looked at the list and the name, the story, there were not that many stories left on it. And the one that jumped out at me was Rumpelstiltskin. Um, and I'd also, you know, so this is uh, sort of talking about how multiple influences come in. I had actually just recently finished reading a book called um, A Distant Mirror, uh, which is about the Black Plague and Europe. Um, a, a spectacular book, by the way, which I, I highly recommend to anyone who loves history. And one of the things that it talked about, which I hadn't myself consciously internalized, was the way that the attacks on um, Jewish communities in Western Europe, which occurred during the Black Plague, um, essentially in a way drove a lot of Jews into Eastern Europe and provided the foundation for those communities that, for instance, my parents, my, my grandparents were in. Um, and that I didn't, you know, I, I knew the story. So I, it was a different side of the story, right? It was looking at the story through a lens of history, through a lens of several hundred years before and having the family stories, which had been told to me as a child in sort of fragmented ways. And those two things plus and of course, in Rumpelstiltskin, the image of, of the gold being spun right out of the straw and the, the rooms being filled up with gold. And that the and of course, the the issue with Rumpelstiltskin, right? Rumpelstiltskin, and this is sort of complicated. You know, I've, I've in fact, you know, talked to, to audiences at Jewish centers and they're like, how is Rumpelstiltskin anti-Semitic? Well, it's, you know, the, the figure of Rumpelstiltskin, the sort of the hoarding of gold right the sense that this is a creature that's hoarding gold you know the long nose that's typically the sort of um and, and the child and who wants to take the child right is connected to the blood libel um and so those elements all kind of go into the pot together right and it becomes it and so when i started writing miriam i knew that rumpelstiltskin was a story that was being told around her it was an actual story in her world and the way she perceived it, right? The, the way she interprets it is that it's a story about not paying your debts, right? That the idea is that it's it's the story of this magic, magic hoard of gold that you who are on the outside of this, of this evil wicked creature get to take this gold and have it. And, and, um, and you get out of what you've agreed to pay because the thing that the, the creature has demanded is so, is so grotesque and inhuman, right? The, the life of a child. Um, and so, and that's the excuse, which she of course, being closer in time to that sort of the destruction of the Western European Jewish communities um, was, is perceiving in a much more, she's she's recognizing it both in her own life where her father is lending money and it's not being paid back. Um, and and uh, she's sort of, she's sort of seeing this story, seeing this sort of action in their community as, um, as, as connected to that sort of pillaging of her larger community. Uh, and yet herself, Right, as an individual, and that's one of the things that I do like to play with in fiction is the ways in which you know these societal these societal biases happen, right? But you're still an individual and an individual human being who has to connect to other human beings um, within them. And so you know where where you where you stand, where you pick your battles. So for instance, Miriam's parents have chosen not to to fight that sort of larger battle. They're just trying to kind of get along with their community, partly because they not incorrectly feel very threatened and they feel their child is threatened. Um, and they also, but they also don't want to become themselves hardened in a way that Miriam hardens herself uh, to, to fight that sort of larger battle. And the ways in which that's, those are the things that, that sort of, 
the pressures, the societal, the, the societal pressure can have those different kinds of hurtful effects on individual characters. And that's something that I kind of like to constantly keep in mind because that's, you know, that's where character choices become illuminating, right? That's what tells you what a person is like. And that's, for instance, how is Miriam not like her father um, while still loving her father? And it, it's not that one of them is right and one of them is wrong. It's just they're human beings and they're making different choices within kind of the same, the same painful and difficult context. Yeah, I, I really like that about the stories because it, it really highlights the fact how gray the world is. A lot of people, especially the younger they are and the less experienced they are, think of the world as in black and white, but it's so many shades of gray. So what Naomi didn't say was that um, her character, Miriam, is actually starving. Like she's this little girl who is starving because her father is too kind to go and play into these biases and, and ask for the money that he loaned back. And so that... I think plays a huge role in hardening her. Right. I mean, yes. In fact, specifically, what's happening at the beginning of Spinning Silver, right, is that um, it, they're not literally at the point of starvation, but they are at the point where they don't have enough fuel to keep the house warm. Um, her mother is ill. Her mother is taken ill, um, and uh, and they just they don't have enough money to kind of buy buy more food, to buy um, more firewood, to buy, to sort of take care of themselves. And that is part of why, uh, you know, Miriam sort of moves into action. Um, that That is kind of her motivating force uh, and her impulse, um, which, is, you know, again, not wrong, right? It's it's a point. And, and the thing is that also what's just happened before she does it is her father has tried. Her father tried to go and collect um, money, and but it's a hard time for kind of everyone in this community. And that's that's the other piece, right? Which is when you start moving back and moving further into the story, which is the community that they are in is itself sort of besieged, right? They're in a small country caught between larger countries with a very dangerous, literally magical enemy that is making the winters last longer. Um, and and so that and that is again that's something that came very much from family experience the sense of you know being in a besieged community within a place that was itself besieged uh and so that there's nobody's wrong to be afraid right nobody's wrong to be sort of like circling the wagons and trying to protect themselves and their community but you know, in a way, what that often leads to is that impulse to um, to push other pieces, other people out of your community to draw the boundary line, and uh, and that that impulse in us that that's a human impulse. That's a thing that that we all do, um, and that impulse often leads to that kind of terrible conflict and and injustice. Yeah, and now if we look at modern times, we're talking about breaking the bias right now as part of the theme for International Women's Day. But what I found in my life is we more often change the bias. We go from, you know, take back the slot was a movement or having women go into the workforce during second and third wave feminism and really being ag aggressive towards women who decide to be stay at home moms. And then the next generation will pick up where we left off with our stereotypes and biases that helped us break our own chains. And they're like, well, that wasn't enough. We're going to take it a little bit further. But the worst thing, not the worst thing, it's a thing, a thing that happens is that technology is starting to increasingly shape the biases and stereotypes in, in which we live. For example, uh, Facebook and the political advertisements we saw, uh, police officers being deployed into neighborhoods based on algorithms, predicting a home's risk of fire and insurance companies using that information to set how much people need to pay. And these are algorithmic biases. And sometimes the biases we have in our worlds help us maneuver the world. Having a bias that you can break helps you break it. So when you're building your world, are you intentionally trying to remove any biases or are there any biases that you embrace as, as part of telling that narrative? Um, I generally feel like that's something that I try to, you know, several of my, several of my books have been uh, in a defined period, 
right? Um, which had sort of its own biases in that period built in. Um, and obviously one is in sort of more or less our modern day. Um, and within those contexts, I often think about, one of the things that I do relatively consciously think about is how can I create a little more space, especially in period works for women? Um, and so for instance, in the Temeraire books, I, I sort of very consciously thought about how do I create space for women to be dragon riders in this universe? Because I want I want there to be women dragon riders, right? I you know for me I want that, um, but I and I also I wanted that for for other readers, and um, and so I literally kind of decided that one of the pieces of this universe was that extremely valuable, extremely powerful dragons would only take there was a, there was sort of a breed of dragons who would only take female riders, and um, and because of that, because they were so important, so valuable, that essentially creates a kind of opening um, for women to participate in in in, a, in this non-traditional um, sort of role. Um, and then at the same time, I also try and foreground women who are in sort of more classically traditional roles, where you know, I feel like a lot of times you, you have to think about the way that the stories that we have heard, the, the histories that we've been told, um, are told from a very specific point of view. Um, you know, I, I one of the things that that being in fandom, right, has taught me and being in many fandoms, I, I, am, I am a fanish butterfly. I tend to be in a fandom for like a couple months and then I flit on to the next one. So I've been through like, you know, 50 fandoms. Um, you know, since since 1994, uh, and one of the things that um, is is was interesting to me as I kind of had more experience was the ways in which, for instance, academia is actually just fandom, right? You know, Shakespeare yeah. fandom, uh, history fandom. Uh, you know, I mean, Temeraire is like partly Napoleonic fa fanfic, right? Uh, and and there's lots of Napoleonic fanfic. Lots of people are doing Napoleon fanfic. Um, and you know, the thing is that so the stories that get told, the stories that we see, are the stories that the people who have the access to share their stories are choosing. And that's largely driven by you know who's got leisure, right? Who's got the leisure to write? Who's got the money? Um, that they don't have to be doing something more lucrative, who's got um, the access to reach other people of like mind. Um, and one of the things that online fandom does as a, so well as a community is that it, it really kind of opens the door. Uh, it, it provides tools. It really makes it possible to reach, to reach one another more easily. Um, and that's and so that kind of conscious, uh, you know, so, so there are ways in which I build my worlds consciously, and I do look for conscious ways to to build them um, that, you know, and for instance, so in Deadly Education, the Scholomance books, I do have uh, this idea of enclavers, right? Um, and Elle, uh, my protagonist, is quite hostile to enclavers and has to sort of overcome in a way has to has to sort of in a way forgive the individual people right she has to she again it's that sort of balance between the societal and the individual she has to sort of identify it's the system it's the system that's the problem and the system is a legitimately bad thing and needs to be confronted and faced and and dismantled um but you still have to love the people inside the system or else it's all just goes you know bad um right and and yet that's extremely hard when you are an in, as an individual being subjected to the full sort of violence of the system and and that and sort of creating creating that kind of system within creating that kind of world creating a world that has that kind of uh interaction in it that has that um you know is is something that's valuable, you know, one of the one of the 
broad things about fantasy fiction, right? One of the things I, I often, people often ask me, like, why do you, why write fantasy fiction? I'm like, fantasy fiction is the superset, right? All fiction is made up. It's all, it's all completely made up. <laughs> you know, it's turtles all the way down, young man, right? Um, it's, so it's all fantasy. Um, and when you're writing realistic fiction or fiction set in the actual, it, you're trying to write fiction that, you know, feels like it could actually happen or could have actually happened in our world, in our time, you have actually constrained your set, right? You've constrained the, your plot and your set to a very narrow frame of possibility where with fantasy fiction, what you have is the power to create the set create the um, the realm of possibility. And within that, as long as you define it clearly enough that people can understand what's, what's possible in this universe, what's likely to happen in this universe, so that they can come with you on the journey, uh, that gives you much more power as a writer to tell a story that focuses on particular, particular things. Um, and, and that's, so, so in a way, yes, I mean, a lot of world building, it engages with bias uh, as one of those elements. Right. Yeah, and we'll do the work for you. Like we'll decide that maybe Arena, that's Serena in Uprooted is a bad person because she's trying to save herself in the like the best way that she as one of those gentle non-fighter women that we see in the real world can by sacrificing the main king bad guy, but he's a bad guy. So I feel bad for him, but you, I, you, you start seeing the complexity of it all without having to write out for the audience. Here's step one. Here's step two. Here's step three. Almost, you know, filling in, giving them space to fill in with their own conclusions and their own biases. Yeah, and, you know that that is um, right. I mean, what I what I always try, you know, when I'm writing a character. Um, no character, I, I don't think, I mean, you know, in Spinning Silver, Chernobog, right, is an actual evil character. Um, and, you know, in fact, one of the one of the ways you know he's evil is that he only rhymes some of the time, um, <laughs> right? Which is, so for instance, the Star King, um, he has a code, right? And he sticks yeah. to it for himself and for other people. He, he tries to, he imposes it unjustly and unfairly on other people yeah. um, who have never wanted to be part of his code, but he also sticks to it completely himself. He is absolutely rigid, um, you know, in that respect. And um, where Chernobog, you know, constantly is just like making deals and breaking them or cheating or, you know, and one of the signs of that is that sometimes he rhymes, but he's not, he's not coherent. He's not consistent enough. He's not true enough to himself to always rhyme. Right. So it seems like he should be rhyming, but he, he doesn't really. Um, uh, and, but that is one very, very small exception. I, I feel like that's, that's almost the, and he's not even really a person, right? He's, he's almost like an archetype. He's a, he's hunger. Uh, and any other character, any human character, certainly, and most other characters, um, like the Star King, the dragons, they are never, they're never a bad guy in their own mind. Um, I think mo almost no one is, right? And so I'm always asking myself, when I write a character, you know, what are they thinking, right? What do they want to have happen? What is their goal? What, why would they do this in any given scene? And, um, and if I, I always privilege, I always prioritize character over any kind of plot idea that I might have. If I have a great idea for an amazing scene and the characters kind of won't go there, then I throw the scene. Uh, because that's, even if literally just one of the characters is just like, I can't, I can't make them want this. I can't make them want to go there. Um, I can't make them do the things that they would do to go there. And that is necessary in order to, for characters to live. Um, and so that, that way, you know, Mernatius in Spinning Silver, the, the king, um, he does terrible things, but uh, it's not so simple, right? Once once you sort of learn more about him, there's there's motivations, there's reasons, 
Um, and very often people are not very, very, I, I think almost nobody, um, for instance, in Spinning Silver is actually particularly heroic. Yeah. Right? Um, they're they're all making sort of quite quite sensible decisions for themselves. And sometimes their choices are just really lousy. Um, and but and of course, you know, the place where the things work is when they start deciding based on love, right? And that's that's I think on love and and community. And I feel like that's that is kind of the sort of secret underlying message, I would say. Yeah, and we're all the bad guys in someone else's story. I have to keep reminding myself that as I approach my life, trying to live and make decisions out of love and kindness. And that's why I'm so grateful for your decision to be kind to us all here at SUSA and in our technology community and have this conversation because it is incredibly important. So before I do let other people ask you questions um, and ask Jenny to come and moderate them, I have one final question. Why is it important for you to have these conversations conversations and talk about biases at this time? Um, you know, I, I will actually sort of answer that more broadly. Uh, one of the reasons that I love having conversations like this is because I find out what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's an interesting alchemy that happens for me when I'm writing, which is I don't know, I don't think out the sentences before they hit the page. Um, the hands and the brain are directly connected. It's not, it's not passing through kind of a language center in a way. And I very often find that as well when I'm giving a talk, when I'm speaking, when when people ask me questions, um, that's that's where kind of uh, thinking happens. And more broadly, that is where reading happens. Uh, I often like to say that you know the quality of a book is no more than fifty, and probably more like ten percent up to the actual author of the book. And all the rest of the actual experience, the individual experience of reading the book is with the reader. And you have to, and, and that is the magic of it, right? The words sitting on a page are not, are not significant. The, the fact that there's like ink on a page makes no, does nothing. It's when somebody else opens the book and takes the ink and takes it into their mind, right? That, that characters come alive, that stories come alive. And it even smells good. Yes. And that's and that's the that is the magic. Um that's that's the true magic, right? There's there's there are things that are truly magical. The the idea that I can, you know, sit here and type something and create pixels on a screen and literally put thoughts into your mind, right? Uh you know, to any sufficiently advanced technology and distinguishable from magic, right? Um and, and that is magic that's it's a kind of telepathy um it's a kind of shared mind and that is and that is so important i think just in general right that's how that's how biases get defeated any any stereotype you know it's like the there's this famous saying which is like no plan of battle survives contact with the enemy right i think very few stereotypes very few biases survive true meeting of the minds with the between the person who has the bias and the subject of the bias um you know because we are just too complicated human beings aren't simple and um and so that's that's the best way right talking communication that's that's how we that's how we break through Speaking of putting thoughts into minds, I'd like to invite our audience to put some thoughts into Naomi's minds by asking your questions and Jenny welcome back um, let us know what the audience is thinking. Yeah, and there's a couple of questions that have been posted in the chat, Naomi, but I'm guessing a lot of people have been so engaged and enthralled by the conversation with you and Katerina, they probably haven't seen them. So I'm just going to read out the first couple and just um, then proceed through the other questions. So the first one is from Natalie. You discuss some of the unspoken and unseen societal pressures that young women face for careers in math and science. Would you say that there are similar pressures or biases that women face as authors? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's different, right? There are, in fact, certain fields in, in publishing um, where where you know, in publishing, in fact, uh, because women are in fact the primary purchasers of books, um, money talks, right? In in our <laughs> in our in our world, um, so it's somewhat different. Um, but there is absolutely, you know, for instance, 
uh, speaking of fan fiction, right? When I started writing professionally and started going to professional science fiction and fantasy fiction uh, conventions, um, at the time, uh, and this was 2000, uh, the early, like 2004, so this is not that long ago, 2005, 2006, um, and at the time, there was absolutely an attitude of negativity um, and hostility to fan fiction in particular. And fan fiction um, is, you know, uh, especially at the time, in fact, it's, it's, slightly, it, it's slightly become a little more fluid now, but um, at the time it was very heavily, um, very heavily women, um, uh, a lot of, of queer women, um, you know, who, writing, uh, writing a lot of slash, and there was a lot of homophobia. There was a lot of sexism involved in like the hostility to fanfic, which by its very nature, right? What makes you want to write fan fiction? You, you want to write it more that the stories you want to see are not being given to you by mainstream media. Um, and so to the extent that mainstream media was um, sort of very heavily, uh, it, it, the more that mainstream media is controlled by people who are not like you, the more you feel that impulse towards fan fiction, right? Um, and the more that the community support around fan fiction is, becomes important to lift up your voices. But because there was this sort of negative sort of stigma to fan fiction, um, you know, sort of absurd things that as soon as you think about them, make no sense, like, oh, it's not original enough. And, and yet nobody's telling somebody who's playing piano that they shouldn't play Mozart, right? Um, nobody tells you that you should start composing your own music instead of jamming on the weekends with a guitar. Um, you know, we, we all kind of realize that it's, it's okay to just sort of do this sort of thing for fun um, and to only sort of want to do the parts of it that you want to do. Maybe you don't want to invent a world and characters. You just want to sort of imagine those characters doing different things than what the, the author intended. Um, and so because of that stigma, what, what was happening very often was women would go pro out of fan fiction, out of the fan fiction community, and they would literally take down all their stories. They would erase their um, any any online presence. Um, it would become a secret that they had ever written fan fiction. They would not talk about fan fiction in conventions, uh, and you know, and and so essentially, what was happening was they were severing themselves off. From this massive supportive community, right? Um, which then, in turn, you know, the the effect of that was people were would get upset if you were going to go pro, right? Because they'd be like, "You're going to take your fiction away from us. You're going to take your story. All, all your stories are going to be taken away." And and in a way that diminished support for people to go to to go pro if they wanted to. And you know, I I sort of take a step to say that I believe deeply in like the, the joy of just making art for yourself and your community. I still write plenty of fan fiction that I post for free. Um, and and the, I do that for my own joy and for the joy of connecting to other fans. Um, and, and that's wonderful. And it's okay that it doesn't always make money, which is sad, sadly something that needs to be said about making art. Um, but so the the sort of this this complex web of of hostility right in a way was severing people from support and so in fact one of the things that i you know when i was finding my first contract which is a very vulnerable time for young writers um and i was very fortunate in that my husband was gainfully employed and had in fact let me take a year off working to write my book um and and try to to go pro um and so because of that, I had, I, had, I had the privilege, right? And I do, I do believe, right, that if you have privilege, the one thing that you should do with it is try to use it to kind of put some ground under other people's feet. And so one of the things that, you know, I, I could say to my editors, I've written fan fiction for 10 years. I love fan fiction. It's great. Um, and, and sort of talk about it aggressively at conventions. And, you know, it's amazing how fast people stop like 
being like sneering at fan fiction when you're like on the pen and you're like, actually, I think fan fiction is absolutely fantastic. And here's the 20 reasons why. And I know a lot more about it than you do because you don't actually read any fan fiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, but that, that's not easy to do. You can't do it unless you've got some ground under your feet, right? Um, and, you know, frankly, like for instance, everybody likes to rag on Fifty Shades of Grey, right? Um, which started life as Twilight fan fiction. I love Fifty Shades of Grey. I've, I've never read it. I love it anyway because it made a billion dollars. And as soon as something makes a billion dollars, nobody, it's okay, <laughs> right? Um, and so in a way, it provides strength to the community. Um, and and that's that's sort of the the value of it. Um, more broadly in in publishing, right? I think that the the pressures that happen in publishing are more subtle, right? I, as a woman, you frequently um, you frequently, and this happens actually in tech as well, right? Women are frequently forced to be better communicators, right? You're typically as a woman often not allowed to get away with coming to an adulthood without being able to speak coherently, without being able to communicate nicely, without being able to make eye contact and smile. You get punished a lot worse by society for not doing these things, even if you and the nerdy guy next to you are in fact quite similar personality-wise, right? Um, and A, that's that's just a burden, that's a cost, um, that then because of it, you know, for instance, when I was in grad school, um, I mysteriously kept getting asked to write all our papers, right? Uh, you know, this is an operating systems and networking, and it takes a lot. It, it, it's not easy to write a technical paper clearly and communicate it well. Um, and of course, I mean, among other things, uh, English was my first language. Um, which was not the case for several other of the students in the in the in the group that I was working in. Um, but that was time that I was I was rewarded for spending my time doing that, right? And in a way, that's one of the most sort of subtle, um, pernicious kinds of biases that you get rewarded for doing things that aren't actually the best thing for you in your long-term career, right? But you're you're rewarded in things that I, frankly, that I think we should value more. You're rewarded by people in your community saying, that's really great, that really helped me out. This was, this was, this was good, um, you know? And you're rewarded by your advisor being like, our paper got accepted um, and now we'll go and present it. And yet you haven't actually gotten to do as much of the technical work, right? Uh, and you have to kind of fight that. Um, and, and so that's something that happens as well in in publishing where you're frequently sort of asked to participate more to um to to sort of be a face more and frequently not uh not compensated the same way um and a lot you know one of the things in modern publishing is that there's this sort of relentless law for content online right you're constantly being asked to produce tiny little videos that don't actually feel meaningful. You're constantly being asked to be a presence on social media. Um, and, and in a lot of ways, that's all time that you're not spending writing. And you have to be able to say no. But A, women are punished more for not for saying no. Um, you know, if you if you get the sort of reputation of like not not being not being generous with your time, that hurts women more than it hurts men. Um, and at the same time, you, you have to do it. So otherwise your, your time can just get sucked completely away. Uh, and so balancing, finding that balancing act is, is more of a challenge for women. Um, you know, and, and in general, I feel like that's one of the things, um, I, I feel like, you know, the, the sort of the idea of lean in, right. And which has been critiqued obviously about this, that, that, you know, it's not always easy to lean in. It's not as easy to lean in for, for women as it is for men. At the same time, I do actually think it's good advice, right? It's like the, you know, the myth of like pulling yourself up from your boost straps, right? Where 
again, it's sort of the common, it's the, it's the distinction between the system and the individual. In, in the system, you know, no, it's not possible to pull yourself up for your bootstraps. It's a lie. As an individual, it's much better for you to still believe it, right? You, you know, you have to sort of lie to yourself in a way and tell yourself, yes, I'm going to do this work. I'm going to be able to do it. I can succeed and pull yourself up. And, um, and that's, so, so in a way you, you want to tell yourself the lie with half your brain, right? While recognizing that it's a lie and not, you need to use the lie only to your own benefit, right? Only as it strengthens you and not allowing it to, to make you blame yourself, right? Um, yeah, so that's, that's my long-winded answer. No, I think, I think everyone that's watching today and listening will find that really interesting because, yeah, we, we see so much of that in the world today where you're presented with challenges that actually it's not the same for everyone. There are some people that have more privilege than others. And just talking about the world today, you know, we, we can't escape from the situation that we find ourselves in, Naomi and Katerina. And uh, there's a really interesting question here where if we think about what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, where there's a situation that you'd think it would be black and white, but we know that the narrative on two sides can be very different. And the question here related to that is asking, are you sometimes surprised at how differently there are interpretations from what were your own when you wrote the words for your book? And how do you deal with those interpretations if they differ from your intent? Have you had much of that, Naomi? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously the the thing is, right, as I, I was already just sort of saying is that I feel like I have 50 to 10% control over what somebody takes away from my work. Um, and then even within that, right, even within that 10 to 50% of control that I have, I can still screw up, right? Um, and, and do something that I didn't intend, um, but that's not but that still is in fact on the page. And as a writer, you kind of, you have to sort of say, well, I'm, I'm still gonna write, right? I'm still gonna do my best. And that's, that's kind of the, the only answer. I feel like the only answer is to do better next time, right? To keep writing, um, to keep working. And I, you know, I do think that the, when somebody takes, you know, the, the, the sort of the very simple advice that I always give to anybody who feels sort of constrained, who's like, but I'm worried that I'm going to be misunderstood. I'm worried that people aren't going to get it, um, is, you know, you have to think of the single work of literature that you love the most, the single movie that you love the most, that has meant the most to you in your life. And then you go on Amazon or Rotten Tomatoes and you read the one star reviews of that thing. And you will find that and the thing is that those one star reviews are not lies. Somebody has not gone like on Goodreads and made up like being angry at your book, right? It's not, it, it's true, but at the same time, it is not the only truth, right? And, um, and you know, that sometimes it's, you can't, and, and as a writer, as a creator, right? That, you know, that, that telepathic mind melding, right? You can't force somebody else. You, you don't get to control somebody else's thoughts, right? You can only share your own. And if they aren't received the way you want, then you also kind of, again, the, and going back to the previous question about the costs and the, the pressures that women face, right? As women, we are often also made to feel that everybody needs to like us, right? That we always have to be nice that we always have to, that that if somebody's angry at us something we have done something wrong and you have to be able to to let go of that a little bit you have to be able to say i can have done my best i can have good intentions i can be a good person and still somebody else can be upset with me for completely re reasonable reasons right they're allowed um you know and there isn't this sort of uh, and so you have to you have to be able to hold those those things in your in your head. You have to be able to value your own thoughts and your own voice. Um, while while and and that's not to say that you should sort of ignore critique, 
but sometimes, you know, for instance, the the piece of advice that I always give to people about anonymous fan fiction, an anonymous comments, right? Which, you know, I I in fact I I strongly don't believe in anonymous comments. Um, and don't typically allow them on my own work, but many people do. And so what I, what I try to tell people with anonymous comments is um, that you should always read an anonymous comment as if it were written by somebody who you know that hates you, <laughs> right? And then you look at that comment and you ask yourself, do they still have a point, right? That's the, that's the thing. You can't just be like, well, they hate me, so I'm going to ignore it. No, you have to be like, but is it still valid, right? Does it still, is it still true in some way? Do I look at this and I'm like, actually, that's kind of useful feedback. It's said in a sort of horrible way. But the thing is, by telling yourself, this is written by somebody who hates me and wants me to die, <laughs> right? You get to not take the emotion of it on, and you get to sort of just take the the sort of the useful pieces of it out. But, and of course, the reality is that 99% of hostile uh, critical feedback is going to be coming from that 50 to 90% of the experience that comes from the reader. Like you've had a bad day and you read something and it made you angry. Like, you know, somebody insulted you on the street and you're mad and you come to this work and like it, something in it echoes the horrible experience you had. You're, you can enjoy it, right? And you shouldn't, it, it's not like the reader has made a mistake. The reader is living their life. Um, the reader is having a real experience. And you have to not, you, you ha kind of have to not take that on for yourself while at the same time keeping an eye out for the useful feedback, right? So that's, that's what I would say. That's fantastic advice, Naomi. I don't think we can add to that. And Katerina, I'm really conscious of time. so. It's a sh I think we could have had double the time, at least, to talk to you, Naomi, but I'll just hand it back to you, Katerina, just to say a little bit more about what's coming in the weeks ahead. Absolutely. Um, as part of International Women's History Month, we are so excited to feature amazing, um, groundbreaking ladies similar to Naomi who are inspiring in their own right. Um, Naomi's the only author, so the other one's you know, tell their stories a little bit differently, but that's what's beautiful about the diversity that we have here in the world, that we can draw from the experiences of the women around us in, in all kinds of ways. And definitely uh, for the audience out there, be sure to check out SUSE's LinkedIn to find more information and, and sign up to those series that are coming up here next week and in the weeks after. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Naomi. I am going to take away everything you said and, and put it in my little happy box and uh, definitely watch this recording as soon as it comes out. Thank you all so much. This was wonderful. Lovely, lovely to, to hang out with you all and to think so much about these, these ideas. Okay, Thanks, thank everyone. Bye-bye.